afternoon ladies and gentlemen and welcome to this sunset safari on this the day of the fly apparently we seem to be beset by little tiny buzzing insects determined to fly either up our noses or into our eyes or into our ears isn't that right andrew mm. now to get us this afternoon folks but welcome to our live safari and to oliver a big warm welcome as to any of the other new viewers who are joining us for the first time to know where we are well we're coming to you live from juma and arathusa game reserves in the sabi sands which falls into the area of the greater national kruger park in the northeastern corner of south africa a place where you have the opportunity to view some of the africa's most spectacular wildlife and explore some of the most exciting stories out here now scotty is on his way to go and see whether or not he can follow up on the Inkahumas from this morning, whilst Andrew and I have the exciting prospect of a shadow possibly on a kill. So, for those of you who are joining us for the first time and have no idea what I'm talking about, the Inkahumas are a pride of lions and shadow is a leopard. I have, don't forget that although we are also live, we are also interactive, so you can send through your questions or your comments on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And we'd love to hear from you, and we'd love to hear where you're from. So tell all your friends and jump on board probably the biggest safari in the entire world. Let's go find our leopard. No fly. My ear is not my ear is not home. It shall not be in my ear. On this hot burning day, it is 32 degrees, which is equates to roughly 89 degrees Fahrenheit. Hotter than the last few days have been, and I'm guessing this is where the hill might be, judging by the off-road tracks. I don't actually know, having not been here before. It looks sort of as though... Oh, well, there we go. And there we go. That was... Whoopsie. I was going to say easier than expected. Look at that. You go, Andrew. You legend. Let's quickly get to her before she jumps down. Hmm. Well, we are just that good, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> totally intentional. Hello, Shadow. It's been a while since I've seen you, my girl. Hello, gorgeous. She looks like she's coming down. How awesome is this? Having a good sniff at whatever's on that tree. Interesting. Has she got, is there a kill there that I'm not seeing? Yes, is there something there she's munching on? Nope, she's just, just seems to be sniffing. The Arlupids have performed some fascinating and intricate behavior over the last few days. Yesterday we encountered Shadow's twin sister, Tundi, for the very first time for most of us, working at Wild Earth as well as most of the viewers. And she was mating with a Tingana. Now, there's a phlegm and grimace, so there's obviously something interesting in that tree. That slight snarl that she made is not a snarl per se, but a way of drawing the scent into the palate of her mouth. Sorry, guys, just give me one moment. Afternoon, I'm on lock with Shadow at her bumper on Zebra Drive. beautiful look at that total agility I'm with shadow on zebra drive that's affirmative she looks like she's about to go mobile sorry guys just letting the other guys know that she is around Copy. There she goes, that incredible descent, the agility of a leopard is unmatched. 
out here. Hello, you're looking very round bellied. I'm just going to let her move past us so I don't drive into her personal space. Let's see if we can follow her and see where she's off to. Sorry, we bumped into Shadow's twin sister, Tandy. And we've just heard reports. There she's marking her territory. Urine scent marking against the tree. And we've just heard reports, which is absolutely fascinating. We speculated about whether or not their mother, Karula, would come and investigate the sounds of mating that she would have heard, which was happening right in the heart of Karula's territory. And it turns out that she did. And the reports from the guides now suggest that Karula is mating, or Karula and Tandi are taking turns to mate with Tingana, which is absolutely extraordinary. I haven't heard about that behavior before. It doesn't surprise me, unduly. But it is fascinating to learn about. Absolutely, this should have been Big Cat Week. So we have a couple of days in a year where we get to go live to television on different occasions, and one of them is Big Cat Week on Nat Geo Wild. And Whitney's absolutely right. The last few days have been big. Oh, girl, I thought you were going to stay sideways and mark there. So I stopped there. Leopards, leopards and their unpredictability. Luck is getting a little bit dense, so I'm glad we spotted her when we did. So obviously with the leopards mating yesterday, we speculate a lot about the dynamics within litters and the fact that the females will often mate with different males. Oh, noisy. I'm hoping she's not going to go too far. She's very full belly. But yes, this, the knowledge that females will mate with as many males as possible to trick the males into the area into believing that they are the father of her cubs. And Jones asked a really interesting question. Hello, girl. You keep getting just ahead of me. <laughs> She's definitely patrolling and scent marking. I wonder who's been around that she feels the need to do that. But Joan wants to know, if leopards mate with different males, during their Easter cycles. Do you know for certain that the leopards from the same litter are, have the same fathers, or is there a possibility that they have different ones? And it's actually a really interesting question because I don't think we fully have known the answer, which is why the research that here is doing... Sorry, guys, let me just get through here. She's going straight into a monkey orange thicket. It's going to be very difficult for us to follow her in. to go. Just let me update the guides on the Game Drive channel. Station Shadow now mobile north into the block. I'm going to try and keep visual. It's quite thick in here. So yes, Joe, you raised a really good point. Do we know that leopards have the same fathers if they come from the same litter? And I think that the Panthera research will be the first time that we've really got some insight into that particular aspect of leopard dynamics. Because of course you can never be in any doubt as to who the mother of a leopard cub is, but you will always know who the, or, but you will never know who the father is. 
moving into this block I'm gonna try and stay with her but while I try to reposition and get around this monkey orange thicket I'm gonna send you over to Scotty who would like to say good afternoon hello everyone and welcome on board the squeaky pig is what we've named this vehicle and you'll probably notice it making quite a racket as we drive around so that's one thing to warn you about my name is scott i'm teamed up with brian and the thumb and they are both back from their leave looking fresh and it's great to have you back brian mm, great to be back now there's an elephant bull that's just crossed over this road heading towards what I think is the Gallagher Waterhole and he was literally running so I think he's very thirsty and we're going to try and race ahead now and hopefully we'll get to the waterhole at the same time as him and get to see him quenching his thirst. Well done to Jamie who got you guys into a great spot with Shadow and I was just saying it's remarkable that for three days now we've had leopard on kills and we haven't been able to get a glimpse of them. So the leopards had had the kills hoisted in the trees. It was Karula for the past two days and then the sa same saga started again this morning with Shadow. So I'm glad Jamie's finally put an end to that streak of bad luck. But bad luck is one thing that we haven't really been having too much of when you think of the wonderful sightings that we've been lucky enough to share with you guys over the last few days. Lions, leopards, elephants, all the game really doing what we need them to do and that is by being in front of the camera not hiding away from us too much and we are going to head towards the Inkahuma pride of lion a little bit later they quite close to our western boundary so there's a small chance that they will head off later on but i think we are going to get some good viewing of them and they're lying up in quite thick bush so what that means is, is that i'm hoping that some potential prey might stumble upon them and without the lions even actually moving they'll be in a scenario where they can hunt so good prospects and we're nearly at this water hole oh there's a buffalo thorn across the road i'm gonna have to just lean out the way they've got very nasty thorns oh Another person we need to welcome into the bush is Jerry, who's in the final control room with Kirsty, and Nikki's got the afternoon off. Nikki and Kirsty have been working very, very hard the last two weeks with no relief. So, not only, of course, are we happy that Jerry's here because it's Jerry who's back, but also it means that it's going to make the other girls' lives a little bit easier. Now, I'm surprised that there is no sign of this elephant. I thought that it would possibly already be here. It was literally running in this direction. And who knows, maybe there were some females that he could smell or something else that had got his attention or got him excited because he was literally running and it wasn't away from us that's that i can assure you there was a few sightings that we had of him oh here we go we're in luck perfect timing here he comes and this is going to be really really cool because like i said i think he's very very thirsty and it's a hot afternoon so who knows he could well spray a lot of this water all over his body i love the way they test the water first oh yeah that looks good
And what a bizarre concept. Imagine snorting liquid into your nostrils until they're full and then blowing it down your throat to drink. There we go, there's the cooling that we expected to see him do. Well, very, very happy to hear that there are lots of welcome backs for Brian. And he's got a big smile on his face. Obviously, it's difficult for him to give you a thumbs up or anything now because he's free holding the camera. There's no tripod. So this is shooting from the hip with Brian Jaber. And I'm sneaking a peek into the little monitor screen that he's watching, and I think he's doing a great job, especially seeing as though he's been relaxing at home for the last couple of weeks. And of course, like anything, you get a little bit rusty if you don't do it for a while, but no signs of rust here. So maybe Brian's been sneaking the odd little video at home. Who knows? He hasn't lost his touch though. Hello to what sounds like a new safari goer, Oliver. And you've been doing some research and heard that we're experiencing a bit of drought here at the moment, and that's entirely correct. This little water hole is artificially pumped, just so that you know where this water comes from. And Brian could possibly just pan a little bit to the left and show you the deck, which is for the Gallego camp. One of the two camps here on Juma, one called Galago and one called Vuyatela, and that's for the guests to look out over during the day so that they've got some game to entertain them. Awesome stuff. And there's also another artificially pumped water hole here on Juma where there's a live water hole camera, Oliver. So the two pumped water sources are both very close to the camp, and at least the animals do have a little bit of water during these dry conditions. But the vegetation is the major problem for them. The, foods, the food load, there's not nearly as much food around as there should be at the moment. And it's not really evident amongst the herbivores. They're still in fairly good shape. Obviously not as good as they would be if it was very lush and plentiful. But when it's really going to start to show is probably in the next three or four months. Animals will really start to lose condition as food becomes more and more scarce as we go into our dry winter months. So it's going to be interesting times ahead. Obviously, anything could happen between now and winter, and we could be fortunate to receive a lot of rain, but the f professionals are forecasting trouble in the future. So I guess it's mainly going to be for the herbivores. Like I said, it's the food load of the vegetation that's the problem. The carnivores are possibly in for a time of plenty. And you've been getting some great close-ups there as the Ellie blows that water out of his nose into his mouth. And to give you an idea of how quickly they can drink a large amount of water, I've seen an elephant suck 20 liters of water out of a bucket in about one and a half to two seconds and then blow it all into its mouth. The whole process being complete in about four or five seconds, 20 liters of water. So, they can consume a lot and they can also throw a lot all over their body as you can see now. And I'd be doing exactly the same thing. If anything, I'd probably be rolling around in this tiny little pond. Not uncommon, speaking of which, for elephants to swim if the water is deep enough. And it's one of the most wonderful things to see. They're like submarines with their trunks acting as a periscope poking out of the water. Hi there, Ashley, and you've noticed that this guy's looking a little bit thin, 
I agree with you to, to a degree, Ashley. Their spine and shoulder blades do often point out. Again, maybe slightly more now than it would in the winter, uh, than it would in a regular summer. But he's not exceptionally thin, and it's not because he's old, Ashley. He, he doesn't look like a very old bull to me, and if anything, I would put him at around 25 to 30 years of age. And it's very difficult to gauge the age of an elephant, but I'd say he's on the younger side, considering they can live to about 60 years. And the reason why I'm saying that is if we take a closer look at his head, we will notice that his temporal dents are not very deep. And that's usually a telltale sign of an old elephant is when you look at their head, not necessarily their body. It can be a little bit tricky to gauge them from that, or at least for me it can, Ashley. We need to rush you across to Jamie. She's got into a good position Sorry, with Shadow. Well, this afternoon, Shadow spoiled us with a tantalizing glimpse of herself before then leading us on a chase through a bush that is incredibly dense and rather difficult to navigate. Andrew doing a fantastic job of tree dodging in the back there. And I will say, ladies and gentlemen, because we are down to one vehicle, sorry, let me get through this. I know that was very noisy, uh, but we did just have to go through. Uh, it's a tricky one to get through, but what was I saying? Oh yes, she gave us a tantalizing glimpse and then made life and tricky. And because we are down to one vehicle, we don't want to risk doing any kind of more damage to poor old Rusty, for example. So just to let you know, if I start to see the vegetation getting too thick and we're going to start to risk the vehicle, then we're going to have to call it off. But at least we've managed a glimpse of her today. Just sorry, guys. Just bear with me. Uh, there we go. They're sorting it out for me. Yes, it has been a day or two days filled with leopards. This is now the fourth different leopard we've had in the last two days. Mvula, Tingana, Tandi and Shadow. And Gerard? You'll notice we, through that whole time when she moved past behind us, I wait a little bit before I reverse. And Gerard, you're wondering what is considered a good personal space to give a leopard. And it depends on the leopard, of course. The Sabi Sands leopards, we're so fortunate to be in this area that they're very, very relaxed with your presence of the or the vehicle's presence around them. And as long as you give them at least 10 meters, if not more, then they are generally absolutely fine. But of course, every animal has its days, a bad day, a good day, and that's why it's so important the entire time that you approach them to be watching their body language, looking for any sign of discomfort. Now, interestingly, yesterday, Tandy was showing, not aggression, but she was, oh, yes, post-mating aggression, and she snarled a couple of times which is interesting to watch, but it was less because of the vehicle and more because of the circumstances around what was happening with that leopard. And as Brent explained, it's post-mating aggression. So that's what I mean by the different circumstances. And interestingly, different characters have different approaches. So you get to know the individual leopards and you start to learn which personalities are more comfortable with the vehicles. Over the last few months, we have seen Tingana mating with 
Kutile, we've seen him mating with Karuna. Shadow has been mating with Tingana. And now Tandi is mating them as well. And so far out of that mix, only Kutile has produced cubs, but she has produced cubs. So there's a chance that Tingana is the father and that he's not sterile, as has been suggested in the past. kutile has got three cubs on the Londolozi boundary. Now the others have shown less signs and have been mating sort of every month or so. We've seen either Shadow or Karuna mating with Tingana. I'm starting to almost feel a little bit sorry for poor old Tingana. He seems to be really embattled, or what would the word be? Well, he's certainly fighting females off almost constantly. And Gail, you've suggested maybe these ladies should find a different male to help impregnate them, since it seems that it doesn't, isn't working terribly well with Tingana. And Gail, they probably are. That's the interesting thing, is that, especially for Shadow, she has been seen mating with the Anderson male as well. And it's just because we are so closely following their stories and have been so lucky in seeing them mating that we're as aware of the fact that they have not fallen pregnant. I think all leopard matings have a certain success or percentage rate of success. We might just be seeing it more closely in that respect. Our stations, um, Shadows now Lalapanzi on a termite mound and the, just past the beginning of this monkey orange thicket. It's quite hard to get in here. Yeah, I'm busy entering the, uh, the block. I'm going to go clean up. Okay, copy. I've got your audio. Sorry, guys, just helping the guides find their way into the sighting. As you can imagine, if you're not following a leopard, it's actually quite tricky to find exactly where we are. It's very dense vegetation, and even at about 20 meters away, the guys probably would actually really struggle to see me. We're quite well hidden where we are. I'm just giving them some instructions to help them out. Here we go, and just giving you sort of a nice overview of the positioning that we're in. I would like to get around to the other side of the termite mound, just examining the ways in which I could do that. I think we better stick with the view that we have for now. <laughs> Rhonda, absolutely, we've gone, no, no, not weeks without seeing the big cats, but we certainly went through a bit of a drought with seeing lions, and leopards were one or two a week. And now all of a sudden we've been spoiled rotten. And it's one of those interesting things about the bush, and I've experienced it time and time again, and I'm sure the other presenters have as well. The fact that you are you go through periods where everything is very quiet and you work extra specially hard and all of a sudden you are rewarded with incredible sightings. And you have to have those periods of drought in order to appreciate how lucky you are to have the sightings that you do have. It's one of those special things about the bush because you never know what it's going to deliver to you. If we knew that we were going to see a leopard every single day, or two leopards every single day, I don't know, but I think it might, it might detract from the excitement, not the joy, certainly, but the excitement that we feel every time we find a leopard to show you. And that surprise and the build-up and the search is half the fun in building the story and getting an idea of the way that these animals move. I'm just trying to see if I can figure out a way that we can get around here maybe make our way across the other side because otherwise the other vehicles are going to struggle to get in around us or have a view of her at least. <laughs> oh, Paul Rizzo. Paul Rizzo is sympathizing with Tingana, saying poor Tingana with all the ladies, smothering him with attention and that poor Rizzo sympathizes because he knows the feeling. I'm impressed, Paul. 
Andrew knows the finger, don't you, Andrew? That's correct. <laughs> and Paul Rizzo has finished that sentence or finished that thought by adding in my dreams to the end of it. <laughs> I know, Tingana does seem very sort of... You have to feel sorry for him, though, because every time he finds a lady, all they want to do is either mate with him and then smack him in the face afterwards. And for new viewers, you have to witness... You have to witness leopard mating in order to understand what I mean. It's a very aggressive act. And every time the male dismounts the female, she turns around and swats him in the face with her claws because it hurts her. So it's one of those fascinating aspects of biological drive. Now it's interesting that this situation has arisen with Karula and Tundi, both mating with Tingana. Now Tundi is Karula's daughter. Shadow has mated with Tingana as well. So we have a, a really nice little um, family occasion that seems to be playing out here at the moment. But Rocky Knight, you're wondering what happens when two males meet each other? For the most part, Rocky Knight, what happens is they lie about 10 meters apart, similar to what you guys may have witnessed with Shadow and Karula a couple of weeks ago with Brent. They lie a couple of meters apart and they go brrrr for a couple of hours on end until one of them decides actually, you know what, you're bigger and gives up and walks away. Sometimes, however, it's a very different matter and their fights will become incredibly physical and they can actually kill each other in those physical clashes. They try and avoid that at all costs. All animals do. They try and avoid coming to physical blows. But with male leopards, it does occasionally happen. Well, interestingly, I've been reading up a little bit about it and apparently un fights between unrelated females over territory can actually be just as serious, uh, if not more so, and very, very aggressive. So with Karun and Shadow, it's mother-daughter, so there's a bit of growling happening there and not much else. But with other leopards, it can be, with unrelated female leopards, it can be almost as serious as, if not more so, a fight between two males for territory. How's it, Cedric? Good and you? Sorry, it's a bit thick in here. She's on the side. Cool. Uh, Jerry, we've talked a lot about the pregnancy possibilities and whether or not maybe they should find a new man to enter into their lives but jerry actually wanted to know when do when does it where does a leopard or a lion go to hide their cubs if they are pregnant or if they do have them and jerry the answer to that is they usually try to find thick dense vegetation in riverbeds or nice rocky outcrops where they can hide their babies so what they'll do is they'll find i'll try and show you in a moment jerry what i would think would be a good leopard denning site so something open like this is probably not ideal. They like to be particularly secretive about it. Nice riverbeds, anything like that, or in a drainage line. That area in the Mawati that we were in yesterday afternoon, Jerry, if you were watching, that would be a perfect place for a leopard to hide her cubs. Now we're going to try and get you a different view on this leopard, and I wanted to just chat to Cedric a little bit about how many vehicles are coming into reciting. In the meantime, since we're being spoiled with big cats, Scott has got another one to show you. Well, it is in fact the perfect cat day. I can't remember who came up with that funny play on words this morning. I think it could have been Diane. And leopards and lions filling up the screens. Awesome, awesome stuff. As you can see though, these Inkuhuma lioness are appearing very lazy for the time being. And I guess they'll continue to be like this for probably another hour or so in all likelihood. I mean, anything's possible, but that was my guess. Unless, of course, some prey stumbles upon them. And we are in quite a thick area. It's quite a windy afternoon. So actually perfect conditions for these lions to get lucky with regards to prey literally walking in on them. And you'll be surprised at how often lions are successful in taking down prey when they're not actually hunting. The prey just 
are unfortunate with their route planning. Now, Ephraim's just arrived in the sighting and he has got no view of the lions really from where he is with his guests. So because they need to race around and see lots of other animals during their short stay, we're going to try and give them a good opportunity to view these lions. And by moving forward, we will be able to show you the fourth lioness. So you've seen three all bundled up there. And if we just creep forward a little bit more, we'll be able to get a good view of the fourth and final one. And that way give Ephraim also a good view of the other three. We might not have a good view of the fourth one, but that's not a problem. It's a view nonetheless, and I'll be able to. Hello to Chamil, who sadly missed out on the sunrise safari and would like to know where Junior is. Well, you must have missed out on a few more safaris than just the sunrise safari because he hasn't been around for quite some time, Jamil. And I'm not actually sure when last he was officially with this pride, but since we've started seeing them again on Juma, which was from about a, a week ago we saw them for the first time, he has not, not been around. And that's no major surprise. He had overstayed his welcome with this pride. And with the presence of the Birmingham Coalition around, it didn't make sense for him to be here because they will punish him in all likelihood with his life if they get a hold of him. So who knows where he is? There's been no confirmed reports of him. But that was an expected change of dynamics to this pride. Hello, Rocky Knights, who would like to know how far exactly are these lines from the Juma Dam Cam? And they're probably a little, about a three quarters of a mile as the crow flies. Um, and I've got a feeling, sadly, that they're not going to head back in that direction this afternoon. They were heading west away from the Dam Cam this morning, straight towards our western boundary. And I guess that when they wake up this evening, that is where they are going to continue to. Hopefully I'm wrong though. They are missing one lioness from this pride and as of about three days ago, she was no longer with them. So nobody knows where she's gone, possibly deeper west into Sibambili. And maybe that's why these four ladies are gonna head back in search of her. And I think that missing individual is Amber Eyes. We didn't get a confirmed view of Amber Eyes this morning, so we think she is the missing individual. And Lucky on YouTube was just wondering where the fifth and final lioness of this pride was. So there we go, Lucky. Now, for those of you who are new to the safari experience, it's not abnormal to see lions asleep. They do spend the majority of their day sleeping and between 16 and 20 hours on average, this will be their preferred position, horizontal. And that's easily swayed in a lot of documentaries that you may see that are obviously condensed for all the high action moments. We, on the other hand, have to all put on our patient pants in order to get those moments of brilliance. The beauty of it though is that we are fortunate in that only we who are sitting out here have to stay with any one animal while you get the joy of bouncing between the two or sometimes three different feeds. So you're never in any place for any one place for too long. Difficult decision for what we should do um, do we stay? Do we go? We don't know what will happen if we do go. These are the questions a safari guide asks himself. Thankfully, a lot of the time we are asking you guys for your thoughts as to what to do. But because I don't think there's any major other exciting prospects at the moment, I'm happy to sit here. Let me know what you guys think. Because that is, after all, 
what a safari is about. It's about everyone collectively joining together and trying to make a plan, obviously because we are on the biggest safari vehicle on the planet, the biggest safari vehicle the planet has ever seen. It makes it difficult to make everyone happy, but we try and work on the general rules of a democracy. Hello Kim, who's just saying how much she would love to be one of the lucky guests on safari here on Jumo or Arethusa. And yes, Kim, people are hugely, hugely lucky to be driven around this wilderness area. But you say you'd like to take photos, you can take photos, Kim. Just take screenshots and the cameramen that we have often are putting you guys into the prime spots to be taking wonderful screenshots. And it's maybe not quite the same as clicking away a picture with a regular camera of your own, but it's as close as you're gonna get. And like I say, there's many viewers of ours that get incredible, incredible screenshots. So maybe that's worth trying until you make a plan to come out and visit, which is obviously something we recommend strongly. If you can ever get out to Africa, to anywhere, we would love you guys to come along, ideally, somewhere where we get to meet you. And it is important to know that if any of you do come to Juma, Arethusa and all surroundings, you will be able to come and visit us. We'll show you around the camp, get to see the final control room, meet the mysterious ladies of that dungeon. And see a little bit of the behind the scenes. And it's always wonderful to meet you guys. So make sure that you let us know in advance so that we can make the calling plans to have you guys in for a visit. Oh wow, this is a surprise. And this is why you just never know what's gonna happen on safari. This is not what I expected. And look at all of Ephraim's happy guests snapping away there on the vehicle. And it may be that she's just wanting to reposition into another shady spot, which it looks like she's done right behind the vehicle, which we're not going to be able to get you a view of. I'm very happy that Ephraim's guests did get lucky and get spoiled with the great view and at least had that line up and on the move. Ah, uh, well, we've already got Diane's thoughts through on whether to stay or whether to go, and she has said that we must stay in case the lions go hunting or in case the prey comes to them. Copy that, Diane. Sounds like a good plan to me. I'm comfortable, even though we are parked in the baking sun, and I'm looking around desperately for some shade, but I don't think we're going to get fortunate enough with that. So enjoy the cool climates wherever you may be sitting as we toast gently under the African sun. Okay, well, while we take our shirts off and get comfortable here, we're gonna send you across to Jamie. Oh guys, unfortunately we had to leave Shadow for two reasons. One, she went into the most unimaginably dense vegetation. And if you thought we were driving through dense vegetation then, this was completely different. This was in a whole different level. And since we are only, or we only really have Rusty and the bushwalk combined with the Mahindra, we cannot afford to risk poor old Rusty getting, getting beaten up as well. And even now I'm sort of apprehensively looking over the side of the vehicle, checking for flat tires and any sign of damage to the vehicle. It so far seems to be okay. And the other reason I had to leave was there's actually two other vehicles, or there's actually six vehicles, waiting for a chance to have a look at her. So they're going to try and stay with her. They're struggling at the moment to get through the vegetation, but they are trying. So I thought for, since we did get 
get to spend a little bit of time in the roads. It was a nice brief view. It just wasn't worth the risk to our vehicle and to our technology or indeed to our cameramen and ourselves. Since the monkey orange decided to savagely attack me on our way out. The monkey orange is one of those, that thick, that thick stuff that we were driving through that was making such a noise on the vehicle. Its Latin name starts with Strychnos. So the family monkey orange is Strychnos family. And that actually stems from, I'm sure many of you would have heard of the strychnine, strychnine poisoning or the poison. And that's actually extracted from the same, or a member of the same family. Luckily for me, given the extent of my <laughs> tiny grievous scratches, which I'm quite sure are okay, I will probably survive them. But luckily for me, our black monkey orange doesn't carry nearly the same toxicity as that particular type of monkey orange plant. It's called monkey orange because it gives the most incredibly round, solid fruit. It's a beautiful fruit, but definitely not something you want to go around eating. It looks edible, it looks delicious, but not something you want to be eating. Is this bird going to let me catch up with it? It's a beautiful one. One for new birders' bird lists. And nope. <laughs> Wood hoopoos. Wood hoopoos are just the worst. Luckily, Andrew managed to catch it flying away from us. Very well done, Andrew. You can hear it, it's laughing at me. Jackling away. There it is, I see you. I see both of you. Well done, Andrew. It looks like it's either oh, it's a, juvenile, a juvenile at the back. The beak doesn't look nearly as red as the adult. In fact, it looks almost completely black. And I think that's a juvenile wood hoopoo. It could be one of two things. It could be a scimitabal or a juvenile wood hoopoo. And the company that it's in suggests to me we're looking at a juvenile wood hoopoe. We don't often get to see that, so that's awesome. And for once, sitting still long enough for us to have a good look at them. A red build, or as it's now known, a green wood hoopoe. Now, all of our birds, or a lot of our birds, have had their names changed recently, just in order to standardize the different names that they're called across the world. And this is one of them. I grew up knowing them as red-billed wood hoopoos. Their cackling laugh of a call. I've noticed that in particular, Arethusa has the most beautiful beautiful bird variety. Now the red bull is how, the easiest way for you to distinguish a red bull wood hoopoe. I touched on a scimitar bull and I'm going to find you a picture of the two of them so that for budding birders when you come and visit us and see the birds in person you will forever be able to identify them. It's actually quite, the, the tricky part is that you can see why a green wood hoopoe is called a green wood hoopoe in this picture, but they only look that color in the sun, much like starlings and, or most of the starling family only take on that glossy sheen, glossy iridescent sheen in the sun. That was what the bird that we were looking at, that bright red bull that curves around. And at the tip of that is this, a whole bundle of sensory nerves that both smell and feel so that that bird can use its probing beak to slide under the bark and catch any insects that might be handing, uh, hiding underneath it. This is the juvenile that we were looking at, a bit darker in color with a dark bill. And this is a, ooh, that's not a scimitar bill, sorry. I was about to show you a wood hoopoe. This is the scimitar bill that I was talking about. You can see very, very similar bird in color but with a black beak. Now the reason that I 
thought it was a juvenile wood hoopoe was because it looked as though it was hanging around the adult to try and beg from it. Quite difficult to distinguish between them, but the red billed have slightly more of a distinct, distinctive red bill, or definitely more of a distinctive red bill, and slightly more barring underneath the tail. They've also got very, very different paws. The red billed wood hoopers have the cackling laugh, whereas the scimitar bills have a very clear, very resounding whistle. Beautiful call. I'm going to carry on. I'm going to move away from Arethusa and take Rusty back onto Juma. And while I do, let's pop back across to Scott and his sleepy lions. So Ephraim has made his way out of the sighting. And now we've been able to reposition. And this is the lioness that squeezed between the two vehicles and reposition and land in the shade behind us. And as you can see, really just enjoying snoozing out the rest of the afternoon. I wonder if they managed to make a small kill last night. It's interesting looking at their stomach, but can't be sure. They're certainly not starving, kind of looking medium in terms of hunger. Hello to Rita who's watching in Johannesburg. And you're interested to know if it's normal for Pride members to go looking for one individual that may be missing. And yes, it certainly is. They are very, very close in terms of bonds and very, very affectionate of one another. So when one member of the Pride is missing, there's no doubt that they miss them and will often look for them and re try and relocate them. Obviously, they understand a lot more in terms of the dynamics than we do within their own pride. And possibly she's a popular individual. And possibly, on the other hand, she's not so popular. And then they'll be less inclined to look for her. And there definitely are going to be ones with higher ranks and more reason to be liked by pride members than others who may not contribute as much to hunting and feeding and protecting the pride. But it's difficult to, for us to be certain of exactly what's going on, especially because we haven't been spending too much time with this pride over the last few months. We used to see them a lot here on Juma, basically up until the Birmingham boys came in in around September, October, I think last year is when they basically arrived, possibly a little, before, a little bit before then. And basically there are five males that have finally reached their prime and have come into this territory and overthrowing the older two males, the Matimba males. They have fled to the south and set up another territory there now and the Birmingham boys caused a lot of havoc as they were establishing themselves here because these ladies weren't very welcoming to the strangers and put up a little bit of resistance and the resistance was met with fierce violence and a few of the lioness from this pride were killed. It's also in all likelihood the major reason why the young male junior who was destined to need to be booted out of this pride. He was a young male born to the pride and males born to any pride when they reach about three years of age will be kicked out by their fathers and if not their fathers, their father's predecessors. Predecessors may be the wrong word, but basically the people who threw their fathers out, which in this case is the Birmingham Coalition. And I'm sure it won't be long before we see some of them again, those Birmingham males. One did move through our property the other night. We had his tracks, but didn't manage to see him, sadly. But they'll be back when there's these lioness coming into season. The males will be sure not to miss a beat there. We've been getting some great close-ups as Brian's been zooming in and out all around the body of this lion. And... What's wonderful about this shot is that you can clearly see the three lobes of that back pad, characteristic of a cat track. Now, if any of you have your domestic cats nearby, you'll be able to see that they've got exactly the same paw shape, just considerably smaller. Dogs, on the other hand, will only have two lobes and a very angled back, back, back pad. You can also see the dew claw there. 
that other little stub sticking out, which is essentially the thumb and four toes on the end of that pad. You may have just seen the claw stick out there as she stretched out, and that's also a good characteristic of a cat. Those claws only poke out when the cat wants them to, so as to keep them sharp and ready to latch on to prey. What's also interesting and difficult to tell now, but worth uh, mentioning now that Brian is on the back paws, the back paws are always the smallest of the paws or the smallest of the feet on any of the four-legged animals because the back legs carry far less weight than the front legs, therefore the front legs and feet need to be bigger and stronger. The bush is quite still in terms of birdsong at the moment, but it'll be interesting now that we're sitting here to take notes of how quiet it is in comparison to how much noise you'll pick up later. Although I am forgetting that I only do have a little lapel mic on this vehicle. So we don't have a speaker picking up the ambient audio like you do on Jamie's vehicle. But it's not just the lions that are on the go slow. Everything out here seems to be having a siesta for now, but that will change and it's a wonderful change to be a part of as the day comes to a close, things cool down. A lot of the diurnal animals, the daytime animals have one final chatter before bedtime. And there's that feeling of kind of unease and tension as darkness falls. to Joyce who would like to know if any new presenters can be expected to come and do interview drives and yes you certainly can expect to see a few more Joyce um, I'm not too sure when though there are none that are penciled in to come uh, at any stage but we are looking uh, f for more presenters and I'm not too sure how many spots are available actually that's not uh, not what I'm involved in but there will be more interviews and Brett and Neil did do great jobs both of them so some of you will remember the interview drives that they did but you must expect to see a few more we're hoping to grow the Safari Live operation in, a, in huge ways, in many different ways this year. So there's going to be a lot of people coming for interviews. There's going to be new cameramen coming for interviews. Uh, and I think all the different positions throughout the Safari Live crew are going to be bolstered up. We've been running kind of on a skeleton crew for the last year, but I think this year things are going to expand quite drastically. Well, at least that's the plan. So expect some changes. Another change before I forget that you guys can expect is that as of the 1st of February, which I think is in a couple of days time, shame that being back just fell onto Brian. That's why the camera may have jolted a little bit. Um, as, on, as of Monday, we're going to be heading out half an hour later in the morning. So 5.30 Central Africa time until 8.30. The afternoon safari, the sunset safari will be staying at the same time for the time being. So talking of changes, that's another thing to be prepared for. And basically all it's going to mean is that we're going to head out just in time to catch the sunrise and we won't be driving around in the dark for so long. So that will change and what will be nice is that the night time will start getting dark and we'll start spending more time with the spotlights at night. Good, good question Joyce and I'm really looking forward to meeting all the new presenters that come through. Obviously not all of them will get the jobs and the positions but it's just great to meet different guides, get to, to learn a few tricks from them and tear a few pages out of their books and of, of course a few will get the job and we look forward to welcoming them to the team. Wonderful, now I'm not too sure what to do. I'm torn whether to wait or to go. I'm, I'm leaning towards waiting here actually and doing a, a full stakeout. So. I hope everyone's happy with that. There is possibly going to be some prey that c comes past here. There's a few open clearings not far from these thickets and wildebeest and parlor like to frequent these clearings in the e evenings because they're safe places to sleep. Now, 
The problem is, is that it's not easy to get to this open clearing without moving through thick bush like this. So we may get lucky and some prey could come nearby and cause these lions to change their tune. For now though, as you can see, we are going to have to put on our extra patient, we're going to have to put on our patient long pants, not the short pants today. Good. Well, we're not going anywhere like I said, but you guys are off to Jamie for a quick update. So I thought what would be a really nice idea, after we had that incredible once in a lifetime dwarf mongoose sighting, I thought it might be quite interesting to come across to where they moved their den to or their burrow to a few days ago and have a look. So for those of you who missed out, we had this amazing sighting with a snake that came through a dwarf mongoose colony while they were foraging. And the end result was that they moved five babies across from where they obviously were hidden in a burrow across to this new den. Now it's in, this bo in the bottom of this raisin leaf, the sandpaper raisin. And I don't see any mongoose hiding there. And I don't hear them either. And usually mongoose are quite noisy Whenever they're foraging, there's a sort of a constant cacophony of contact calls between the members. Just interesting to follow up because they were clearly thinking about staying for a period of time since they were scent marking and just sort of generally making it home. And scurrying around, pasting on the grass stems and then rubbing their cheeks, which is where they have glands as well, on all of the bases of the plants there. Whether that means they've moved or whether it means that they are still in the area and just out foraging, I'm not too sure. I don't know whether they've decided to move the babies further away from the threat of a snake. But what we've seen with that, and I think it is the same black number that I saw and that Scott saw, they are, they are sort of territorial, the really big ones tend to move in the same sorts of areas. So I wonder if whether or not that cobra might be doing something similar or at least spending a bit of time around here. And if that was the case, perhaps they've moved a bit further, or they've just moved their babies as part of a natural course of moving from den site to den site. Just a nice little follow-on from that sighting that we had. They cover territories easily a third of the size of the Sabi Sands. So that could be Buffalo so plus Torchwood plus Juma, Arethusa, and all of the little properties around them. That would be the home range of just one of the dogs' packs. 12,000 hectares is about the sort of minimum area that they like to have and the, the areas that they like to cover. So it could just be that at the moment it timed itself so coincidentally they both happen to be away in different parts of the area. I also think, Kim, and this is borne out to, cert to a certain extent, a hey, fly, don't fight me, to a certain extent with research, animals, wild dogs in particular, don't like lions. And the smell of lions and the calls of lions should be enough, particularly since both packs have pups, for the possibility that they're avoiding areas where there are lions. So for a while, the lions were not moving around on the Juma property itself, they were moving around the outskirts. So maybe that played a role in the fact that we were seeing as many wild, or having as many wild dog sightings as we were. That's just a thought, and that's more, it could be completely coincidental, or there might be a connection. But there is research that suggests that wild dogs will avoid lions, which makes sense because lions kill them. It's competition and that's just how the natural order plays out. But it's a very good observation and it's an interesting one. 
way, we're not complaining. I think we've had some spectacular sightings with both wild dogs and big cats. Valerie, while we can't guarantee wild dogs, although we have managed to guarantee you some cats over the last few days, bear with me if I don't look at the camera right now. I always have a slight worry that Treehouse Dam Wall is going to slide away from under me. Has suggested that I go to the hyena den. Perhaps the hyena den visit is in order. Valerie, I completely agree. It was definitely on my agenda. And barring anything unforeseen, such as, for example, a wild dog pack comes racing past us. And now, at the moment, whenever I say that, I always stop to look because for some reason over the last few weeks, we've actually had timing like that that's been absolutely perfect. Wild dogs and hyena dens, Karula popping out just when she was asked to. So Valerie, yes, it is on my agenda, and I'm sure many of the other viewers are also keen to go there. And I like to give it a couple of days in between just to keep things nice and fresh for myself and to give me an opportunity to explore other areas on the reserve before returning back to probably one of my favorite places. And of course, we always, the, the longer they stay at the den, the more we have all the greater the chance that they're actually going to move and then we have to find them all over again. And we'll have a rough idea as to where to start, but there's lots and lots of termite mounds for them to utilize. You're going to run away, little Dacre, or you're going to be obliging. You can stay, girl. Big scratch. Nice to see a slightly more relaxed Dacre. Little male with horns sticking up. And of course in Dacre. And this is a grey Dacre or a common Dacre. It's the family, it's in the family of, that contains the smallest antelope species in the entire world. That is the blue Dacre. And unfortunately, if we saw one here, it would be one very lost blue dacre because they tend to inhabit the more coastal forest areas of South Africa. We wouldn't expect to see one around here, but we can see its cousin, the gray or the common dacre that we're looking at now. And a blue dacre is not much larger than a large chicken, whereas the gray dacre is a little bit bigger to try and give you an idea it's probably about the size of a fox terrier if you're familiar with dog breeds so still a small little antelope and quite a shy one apparently gone hiding behind the termite mound i have a question andrew has a question let's hear the question andrew i heard that they eat birds is that true this is true andrew has heard andrew from the back of rusty Andrew's watching the show and directing the camera from the back of Rusty. And Andrew would like to know, is it true that dacres eat birds? And yes, they do. All animals will occasionally supplement their diet with things like carcasses or nibbling on carcasses or possibly even eating a bird's egg if they find it. This is particularly true with dacre. They, for some reason, where is this little dacre gone? I always find you look at Dacre a little bit differently when you learn this fact. It becomes slightly scarier somehow. <laughs> Unfortunately for us, our little male Dacre has disappeared, probably to go seek out a bird to munch on. But yes, for some reason with Dacre, it's more common for them to nibble on carcasses. But it's particularly, in terms of the, the mainly herbivore animals, particularly prevalent in Warthog and in Dacre. So yes, they will eat birds. Yummy, crunchy, Ugh. There's something, I don't know what it is. And it's, it's totally rational on my part. I don't know why it's, it's almost sinister to think of a dacre eating a bird. Because they're antelope and because they're herbivores, it sort of goes against our natural instincts as to what they should do. But welcome, Andrew, to the Sunset Safari. It's great to have you on board with us. <laughs> Andrew's excited. <laughs> well, that's 
nice news. Now, Scott apparently is on his way since he's left the Lions to rest up a little bit. He's going to go out and go on foot for a while and then return to the Mahindra. And it's actually this whole process that we've had to conduct over the last few weeks or the last few days since poor old Jigger had to have, I think as Scott described it, the equivalent of open heart surgery. We've actually had been able to give you guys quite an intricate background view of the way that we operate, setting up with Mahindra, going out on bushwalk. It's all been a very interesting and different way of doing things. The nice thing about it, of course, is that the Wild Earth team is such a good team that everybody works fairly seamlessly together. And it's just a question of making a plan. And Jigo will be up and running. As you will have noticed, I've actually been testing out Rusty this afternoon, driving Rusty to areas where perhaps she wouldn't have been able to drive before. And so far, I've been very impressed. So a huge bravo to our tech team who've been able to help Rusty out with her little niggles. It's been a long time since I've been able to drive along Elephant Parkers. And that's the road I'm on, by the way. It's not a legitimate elephant carcass. Although you probably find with the road names, at some point there was an elephant carcass. It's out here. And apparently, as I said, you may have experienced a little bit in the way of jumping with the audio, but never fear, you didn't miss anything terribly major. <laughs> so Andrew, Andrew has been labelled as multi-talented by Kim B, who's impressed with his ability to both interact with us as well as conduct or to do his usual brilliant camera work. Our cameramen are definitely multi-talented and certainly amongst some of the most entertaining staff members at Wild Earth, both on the vehicle and behind the scenes. and thick and fast, eh, Andrew? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Kat, in Tampa, you were complimenting me and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Kat has said that I'm an inspiration and have I always wanted to do what I do. I certainly don't see myself as an inspiration. I see the people that I have learned from and been mentored by as my inspiration in life. But I appreciate your compliments. And Kat, Step first before I answer your question. Otherwise, yeah. to Kat's question, yes, I've always wanted to do what I'm doing now. Very, very... I think I might be imagining things in the hole of that tree. I'm just going to go back and double check. I think it was cemented. I'm looking at the hole in that jackalberry tree. I thought I saw something move in it. But that may have just been a branch waving. Mm, the shadow. Or the shadow. I think it was the shadow. Well, oh, that's embarrassing. Oh well. You never know. It could have been a snake, a bird. In this case, it was a shadow, but next time it will be something else. Like that water bucket that's standing over there. <laughs> totally conveniently. Thank you, water buck. If only you were on the same side, I could have claimed that I was looking at the water buck. Cat, I've always wanted to do this particular 
kind of job. Narrowing down the possibilities, of course, has always been difficult, and this presenting job certainly came as a surprise. If you told me a year ago that this is where I would be, I would probably have laughed. Just goes to show, you never know which way, which direction life is going to take you in. But I'm, I think, and I'm sure Andrew will agree, that we've fallen into probably one of the most pleasant activities that we could actually call a profession. When I was little, I have very strong memories, or some of my earliest memories are of going to visit the Kruger. And I very vividly remember. It must have been, apparently I was about two years old at that point. I'm trying to get you a nice view of these water bucks since they are so being so considerate. Hello water buck. Good afternoon. Tell us ladies, have you always wanted to be water bucks? It's okay girlies. It's okay. My goodness me. I would not want to be on water back on an afternoon like this afternoon. They must be so warm. This one to the right of us is not only fluffy. I didn't see that one. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> That's okay, I just saw a shadow that I thought was something else. This fluffy water buck, I actually think, as she disappears behind the weeping wattle, that she might be pregnant. We haven't seen many water buck calves recently. She does look very bulgy to me. She's also missing half of her tail, interestingly enough. Bye bye, water buck off into some dense vegetation. So that fluffy coat, of course, is what they use to waterproof themselves in areas that they wander through in rivers at the moment for them. Unfortunately, there's not much in the way of water for them to spend their day wandering through. They tend to favor nice, fast-flowing rivers that they can be safe from crocodiles in, shallow, fast-flowing that fur in the afternoon light gives you an idea of how long it is around the neck and the belly. A gentle glow, almost an angelic glow in this light with that ubiquitous white ring around the rump. The mysterious white ring of the water buck. Nobody really knows why they have that white ring. It will be one of those mysteries that perhaps we may never solve. And we have more mysteries to take you on, but that will be Scott's job as he takes over and drives along a little bit in the Mahindra. So, as you can see, the stakeout has come to a close, but we are going to head back to those lions shortly. We just couldn't bear sitting in the baking sun with such sleepy lions for much longer. And what we did was we checked kind of north and south of their position to see if there was any potential prey that could stumble upon them, and there was nothing evident. So I think it's a safe, fairly safe bet that nothing is going to happen while we are gone and couldn't help resisting exploring and seeing what else may be happening here on Juma. Not too much at the outset to report, but that of course could change at any moment. Yvonne in Sweden and thank you very much for your kind words. It does take a bit of getting used to non-stop chatting, looking down the eye of the camera, but of course it's made so much easier by all your interactions, kind words, comments, questions. So in ways it's 
easier than actually being with just six guests on the back of your vehicle, which is the usual number. So it's not too bad. And like I say, you, you guys make it easier than expected. Thankfully also, we're not always on air for three hours and we do have these little breaks when you go onto your other, other vehicle, you know, where we can regain composure and think about what else to talk about. But there's just so much going on that it's not too difficult for us to find something interesting to discuss, I guess. But thank you very much, Yvonne. It has taken a little bit of getting used to, that's for certain but really am loving being involved in the Safari Live adventure with all of you guys. And what's gonna be really interesting, like we were discussing a little bit earlier, is as soon as we get a few more guides and presenters, for those of you who have been following these safaris for quite some time, you'll notice the, the benefits that each new presenter brings and everyone's slightly different and has different traits and different skill sets. And of course, the more people that we employ to take you out on safari, the more diversity you guys are gonna get and I think the more enjoyable it's gonna become. So, good prospects and Obviously, as the Safari Live product grows, it's becoming more and more attractive for various guys to be, want to be a part of this. Whereas many years ago, it was a little bit easier to get a spot here. Now it's becoming harder. Oh, here's a pretty bird. And, as Brian zooms in on this European roller, very pretty pale blue against the darker blue sky. And Peter, you would like to know if the cameramen have also got comms. And yes, they certainly do. It's imperative that they know what's going on. Brian's just pulled out the punch zoom, getting it up close and personal there. And just another reminder that he is shooting from the hip. There's no tripod involved. And obviously as he does this very impressive close-up, it becomes extremely difficult to hold the camera completely still. But yes, Peter, the cameramen are tuned into the same comms as us, and it's very useful that they are. It's obviously important as we get uh, cut to, as we become live from being non-live, that they know what's going on. Often there's crash cuts due to one vehicle losing signal, and there may not be time for me to quickly prepare the cameraman. And the directors ask also give them little hinters and tips as to what shots they may be wanting at any given time. And it takes a lot of getting used to building up the relationship between a presenter and a cameraman. And it certainly only comes with time that you work one another out and synchronize your movements to make an effective safari, flowing safari in terms of the picture working out with the narrative. And the cameraman, so each presenter has their different traits that they need to get used to, as do the cameramen each have their different traits. So it's been wonderful getting to know the current cameramen. Viam and Andrew have been here the longest, and they were here just before I arrived in November 2014. And subsequently Andrew joined, who's also been here for very long, and then Jandre joined, and then Tebs. But Tebs has now left us. Um, and John Dre, even though has temporarily gone, he's doing an awesome project in Madagascar at the moment. Um, been following his pictures on Instagram. And he'll be back in March though, so that was a prior commitment that he had already worked out before he joined us at Safari Live. So Jean-Dre is going to be coming back, and I think they are going to be looking for a new tech cameraman to replace Tebs. So we're going to get a old face back and a new face into the team. But it's fair to say that Andrew, Viam, and Brian have all got great sync with the current presenters. And so, so too does Jandre, who's gonna be returning. And I'm sure it won't take long for the fifth and new recruit whenever he is found and arrives to do the same thing. <laughs> Dr. Debbie, I would... Uh, like you to ask this question to the powers that be, not me. Um, as you said that you think we should start interviewing some new vehicles. And sadly that is 
outside of my pay grade. But don't worry, Debbie, of course, uh, everything is being done with regards to trying to get better equipment, with regards to cameras, vehicles, everything. And don't worry, there are some plans in place, but it's not as easy as just buying a new vehicle, of course, as you understand, there are huge financial things that are not at stake, but that need to be factored into the equation. Look at how awesome this site is. An adult kudu with a very, very young little calf. Look at how inquisitive it was of us until eventually I thought, hang on, I don't trust these guys. But due to its mother's relaxed behavior, so too will this youngster probably relax and become habituated with vehicles over time. But for now, not quite sure what to make of us. Could possibly be the same individual that you guys last saw with Jamie. I think that was the last baby kudu that we saw. So Dr. Debbie, like I said, don't worry. The people involved in acquiring all the new toys for us here at Safari Live have got big plans for the future. And for now, we're just gonna have to keep making do with what we've got. And, you know, everything does happen for a reason. And I think it's quite fun, the fact that now Brian's shooting from the hip, we're taking a different vehicle around. It just mixes things up, you know, and for everyone involved, uh, change of scenery is as good as a holiday. And even though we're on a vehicle, we're on a different vehicle, having a slightly different experience to the normal vehicles. And I'm certainly enjoying it, as I'm sure a lot of you are, are as well. So just gonna roll with the blows out here. Also, it means we are forced to spend more time on foot, which is also good fun. to Lael in Washington and you'd like to know why we do not interview any camera women? Good question. I don't know. Possibly none have applied for the jobs that have been advertised. That would be my logical thinking. Um, as you know, we've got Jamie as a female presenter. We've got a lot of girls in our team in the final control room. And I know Nikki has spent a little bit of time on camera and sadly she's fixed to a position as a director, but she is hoping to spend a lot more time on camera just to get some fresh air. She loves being out, and as much as she loves her role as a director, she really does miss not being out on the vehicle. So I think that's possibly gonna be a change that we see this year. And Nikki will be on camera more and more just to get her bush fix. So that is the plan. Okay, well, we're gonna slowly weave our way back to those lion now and we're gonna send you back to Jamie. See you later. And in this kind of afternoon light, a trio of battaliers doesn't really get much more spectacular than this. It's the same trio that we saw yesterday morning hanging out in roughly the same area. We very often see the mated pair, and they've been joined by a third. And I mentioned that I thought there's a possibility of it being a male offspring. The mated pair are definitely the two huddled close together. The one on the far left, now sidling up to the lady, is the male. You can see that he's missing that white bar across the bottom of the wing that she has. sitting perched in a dead tree doing what I've noticed raptors do fairly regularly at the moment which is to face into the wind to try and stay perched comfortably without having their feathers ruffled and then above them is this third wheel in this scenario I'm surprised that he's still with them I saw him the other morning as I said I saw him as well do I know for certain that it's him? No, but I suspect the, the chances of it being a different battalier in exactly the same area with the same pair is probably fairly slim. Could be an adult offspring. 
we often see a juvenile moving around with this mated pair of battaliers. Now what's interesting that I've just thought about is I've, and many of the other presenters as well, have always told you that it takes a battalier chick about seven to eight years to gain that adult coloring, that striking red face, the black white plumage, everything that we have come to know and love about it, battalier coloring. And yet, I've just really thought about it now, I've never wondered about how rapidly that change happens. I guess it must happen in sort of one fell swoop. So they molt their feathers and grow new ones pretty much as baby chicks grow their adult feathers. But then I suppose it could be the juvenile that we've seen fairly regularly. And while we're looking at these incredible predators, it's always a great moment, a great opportunity to look at the hooked bill or beak and the sharp claws. But I've said bill or beak, and Mary, you wanted to know if there was a difference between the terms bill or beak. Um, Mary, as far as I know, there isn't much of a difference. I think they're fairly interchangeable. I'm just trying to think, I would probably be more inclined to use beak for raptors and bill for something like a red-billed wood hoopoo. And as you commented, it's a very, using the word bill in the name is quite a common occurrence. I'm trying to think if there's any birds off the top of my head that have beaked in their name. You see, I'm inclined to make a, dis make a distinction with probing, long probing beaks being bulls. <laughs> and raptors' beaks being beaks. Now I'm really tying myself in knots here. Hmm. Interesting question, Mary. I'm trying to think if it's maybe just a an ink, one of those funny English distinctions that just has evolved in different ways. I don't know if any of the viewers want to correct me on that, if I'm maybe getting the distinction for bill or beak wrong, but I think they're pretty much interchangeable. Interesting enough. Very good question. Bill and beak. Either way, they do have spectacular bills slash beaks. That bright red color that I've always found so fascinating in them. And of course that matches their legs perfectly. They're very well dressed birds or very well, they've thought out their outfits very well. Black, of course, always being a flattering color on everything. And then a striking flash of color to bring out the best in them. And those scaly legs are, oh, they're talking to each other. It was a gentle call from one of them. I'm not sure which one it was. We know that the male has been seen mating with the female not too long ago. Bit odd though, that they have their friend accompanying them as he gently checks on his mate. And Jim Butler, you've suggested that our third wheel battalier has been friend zoned. I suspect it's a juvenile or related to them in some way, a chick that has reached adulthood. I really, honestly, I'm not sure. Perhaps he's just hoping for a chance to get to know her better on the side. Fascinating to consider the options. It's not uncommon to see battaliers together around kill sites. This isn't what's happening here, but I have seen them in social settings like that. And I've seen vultures mate with multiple males, so maybe there's an aspect of that to the battalier personality as well. But speaking of raptors and the different kinds that we get, Scott has got one of the close relatives of the battalier. So from one bird of prey to another, this is considerably smaller than the battaliers you were looking at with Jamie, and it's called a common buzzard, 
formerly known as a steppe buzzard, named after the steppe mountain range in Russia, where it spends its winter months. Hard to believe that this bird travels all the way up there to Eastern Europe, Siberia and Russia, where it breeds and comes to the southern parts of Africa, all the way down to the Western Cape, which is actually where they are most popul uh, they are most densely populated. And as it sits up there perched on this dead marula tree, it's looking for prey, which it mainly goes after insects and very small birds occasionally. So that's what it's looking for up there. And they often hunt from a vantage point like this. In more suburban areas, you'll often find them sitting on street poles or telephone poles as their hunting vantage point. We've been here for about 10 minutes though and it hasn't seemed to find anything to feed on, sadly. We may give it a few more minutes just to see if we don't get lucky to see it make a kill. You can see it's certainly scanning the ground. But a lot of the migrants who've traveled massive, massive distances are probably a little bit disappointed with what South Africa's put on the buffet this summer because there's not nearly as many insects around as normal, and that's due to the drought conditions. It has not been a plentiful year with regards to rain, and therefore vegetation and insect numbers are also quite low. Okay, well, we have had some great views of it. It doesn't look like too much is going to happen for now other than it may be getting blown off that stump. It's quite windy and I'm hoping this cool breeze is going to cause those four Inkahuma lioness to get up a little bit earlier than normal today. So let's go and see what they're up to. <clears throat> Hi there, Mimi in Canada. I hope everything is going well with you. And you've heard that the lions in the Sabi Sands get vaccinated for rabies, and you'd like to know how this gets done. And it's interesting. I wonder if all of the lions do get vaccinated. I know there's, go there's been stages where that has happened in the past, but I'm not sure if it's still being done, so I cannot confirm how true that is, although like I said, I do know it has been done in the past um, and it's basically done by vets who will dart the, the lions with the necessary inoculation. That's how it used to be done a few years ago when I knew it was happening. Um, so yeah, like I said, I haven't heard of it being done and how they used to uh, mark the lions is they used to give them a small brand on their, on their hide to show that they had been inoculated so you could distinguish one lines that had been from lines that hadn't been but that's not happening maybe they've got a different way of keeping track which line has been inoculated if they are still doing that but we tend to not get hugely involved in the management of the animals and our job here is simply to take people around and show you the different animals and I leave the professionals to do all that kind of business of inoculations and getting involved with that kind of that kind of thing that is often left best to the professionals and for us not to stick our noses into too much in Arkansas you ask a question that brings great sorrow to my heart you have brought up the topic of the bird box and it is what's going on there Bebop I'm not hearing anything um, Shane Brown's radio is giving him a hard time um, so 
Marianne, the bird box that I built in order to hopefully help the birds of this area and provide them with an extra home, which are in high demand in the nesting season, which is now, is uninhabited. I have yet to find a tenant. I'm offering the place for free and nobody's interested. So not too sure what it could be. Um, I need to actually just change its position because even though a lot of the birds have already successfully raised their chicks, they may well try and give birth to a, another, give birth, lay another set of eggs and raise another clutch this season. It's not uncommon for birds to have two or three clutches in one summer season, depending on the bird. So there is still a demand for nest sites and maybe I just need to change the tree that it's hung up in, but there's been no interest whatsoever that I've seen. I opened the lid uh, that allows you to look inside it um, in the hope that we'd be able to monitor the chicks growing up. Um, indicates that there's not even a blade of grass in there. It's like something hasn't even thought about trying to make it comfortable or homely. So who knows what the issue could be. I'm confident there's nothing wrong with the design, so it must be something to do with where it's positioned, the tree it's positioned on, that's all I can guess. So maybe worth doing and maybe I'll, I'll string it up onto a different tree tomorrow and see if it doesn't provide us with better results, because it'll be so awesome if it does work out, Marianne. Okay, well, I'm gonna send you back to Jamie for a quick update and change of scenery on her vehicle. the most beautiful afternoon, but the sun is incredibly bright. Every time I turn around to look at the camera, I'm struck by its glaring rays. It seems to be every time I manage to position the car, I seem to be looking straight into it. And I'm starting to notice it now. You get these sort of period of about three months in the middle of summer where it's perfect. It moves so high in the sky, and it's up in the sky very early. And then as winter starts to arrive, of course, or as, at least as autumn starts to arrive, the sun starts to move lower through the sky. And the beams are, the afternoon, a lot more of your afternoon is spent squinting into the sunlight. I'm slowly, slowly making my way across to the hyena den. Because it is so hot this afternoon, I'm not in a rush to go there because I know that once I get there, they're all going to be fairly sleepy and not in the mood to play. And of course, whilst it is wonderful to watch them at the den, it's much nicer when they're feeling energetic and decide to come out. And for new viewers, if you are joining us for the first time and you haven't been to the hyena den, stick around because, first of all, the lions are going to be up and about later this evening, but also because the hyena den is a really special treat to see what a baby spotted hyena looks like when they are under three months old. And of course, any baby animal is almost impossible to resist. Luckily, we seem to have escaped that shadow sighting without any kind of flat tires. Now, I've been thinking about Shadow and the discussions we've had about Tingana and the pregnancies, or the lack thereof in this particular case. I was just thinking that the one leopard that we don't know whether or not she's pregnant is Shadow. She's been pulling disappearing acts on us for days and days at a time, and not just us, but the other guides in the area as well. And I wonder, particularly since she's been spending more and more time around the drainage lines at Arethusa as well as that block where we lost her this afternoon. I'm starting to wonder whether or not there is a possibility that she might be approaching the end of a pregnancy. Impossible, it was very difficult to tell this afternoon. She was very, very full, big round stomach. I couldn't see any signs of supple marks. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. It'll be one of those things where we won't know until we know. Thank you to Zoomy Mike and 
and to James Richard and many, many others who sent through the information on beeps and bills and that they are almost essentially interchangeable, but a beak refers to a hooked bill. Oh, these must be the line tracks from this morning that I'm looking at. They must have come through from Torchwood because they've been driven over. Yes, thank you. That's sort of kind of what I was getting at when I said I feel like the raptor's beak. But then, as Andrew said, um, once we'd sent you guys back across to Scott, we get yellow billed pipes that have hooked raptor beaks. It's, a, it's an interesting distinction. It's obviously one of those where the, the distinction has slowly become blurred. Thank you nonetheless for your update because I had that, you know when you know something, but all of it might not actually be the way that you think it is. I did have one of those moments. So thank you for clarifying as to the distinction between beaks and bowls. The fact that all of a sudden you go black screen. <laughs> that you hold. The nice thing about this afternoon as well is that it is so noticeable how green the grass has gone, even with just that little bit of rain that we had recently. It looks like a whole different place that we're driving through. And it might not have been enough to fill up the dams, but at least it was enough to start to supplement the grass. And on the topic of drought, we had a question come through from a curious one about how the farmers managed to feed their cattle. Oh, something's happening with Scott. Let's head over to him. I'm not sure what's going on here, but there's some lapwings that are displaying, holding their wings up high. And usually they'll do this when they're on some kind of distress, trying to get the attention of a predator, move it away from a nest possibly. But what's interesting here is there's a combination of Senegal lapwings with crowned lapwings. So two different kind of lapwings, and who knows what's going on here. Maybe it's an inter-lapwing dispute. And that's what it seems like could be going on here. There's three crowned lapwings. They're the ones holding up their wings with that white crown. And the smaller birds are the Senegal lapwings. This is phenomenal. Maybe it's some kind of a mating display between the crowned lapwings that's attracted these others, but no. I think they could be vying for a nest site. I mean, it's bizarre. There's so much space on the ground here, and that's where they nest. They just nest out in bare, open patches of soil with a very cryptically camouflaged nest. But every now and then, they appear to be looking at something in there. So, I don't know. Uh, where are you now? I don't know what exactly is going on. What will be nice is maybe to take a walk over there. Go and have a closer look as to exactly what's happening. As I got a feeling there could be a nest or maybe some small chicks in and around that little bush that they're in. So, 
Let's watch and see what happens if I head out there. Now you may lose my audio if I get a bit too far, but let me just shoot across and see what happens. Of course, the birds may be temporarily a little bit frightened, but we need to find out what exactly is causing this behavior. So we'll just go in quickly and then move back out. Sorry birds, this is for science. Obviously I need to be careful I don't step on the cryptically camouflaged eggs. Probably reach limits that my little lapel mic will be picked up on. But thankfully you can still hear me. This is the area that they were looking into. And you have no idea how well camouflaged these eggs are. So I'm just making sure, as well as the chicks. The chicks are also incredibly well camouflaged. And obviously don't want to be standing on one. This is what they were looking in and amongst. And there's literally nothing to see here. So... All one can do is scratch their head. <laughs> but awesome to see them holding up their wings like that and that's what they'll do let's say that their nest is this little stick on the ground yeah, and they see a predator walking towards it or even a buffalo often what those birds will do is they'll feign injury and they'll drag the predator away to what looks like an easy meal and then as soon as the predator's far away from the nest they'll flutter away um taking the day away from the chick or possibly the eggs as I said they are literally laid in a very shallow scrape on the ground so rely entirely on camouflage and their parents to detract other animals from them or distract other predators from them or animals like a herd of buffalo will literally be stood up against the bird will hold up its wings and just tell that buffalo huge animals even elephants not to pass and most of the time the buffalo will go around them so as soon as I saw those wings being held up from a distance, I thought we were in for some action. But no joy. What we were doing coming up into this little open clearing was just double checking that there was no possible prey for the Inkahuma lioness who are lying up about a couple of hundred meters in front of us. But I'm confident that later on, some herbivores will be moving through this area to get to these little open clearings where they like to spend their evenings. Provides good safety being out in an open area where predators don't have good obstacles to use as cover to stalk closer to them on. You see, I think Gracie, who's just eight years old, may well have cracked the code to why the little bird nest that I built has not been occupied. And Gracie, thank you for making this suggestion. You think that if I put some worms in and around that box, it'll lure the birds towards it, it'll attract them to it, and then realize that this is the perfect home. It comes included with worms. And I'm just going to have a hard time finding all these worms, but maybe if I get Brent and Jamie, we'll be able to dig around enough to find some. Kirsty just mentioned to me that the radio was going static and crazy, which indeed it was, and cursed. Neither Brian and myself had anything to do with that, so possibly the aliens are invading. So where Brian's pointing the camera now is where the lioness are sleeping. And we'll get some much better views shortly once we slot into position. And David in the UK, you are on the same wa wavelength that I was on. As soon as I saw those lapwings holding up their wings like that, I thought it was a snake on the ground causing some trouble. 
that they're trying to distract away from the nest. But yeah, it certainly wasn't the case this time. It looked like a, oh, let's have a look here, Brian, there's one lioness just up in mobile. You can see another one has joined, well, you will see shortly that another one has joined the one lioness that came out to sleep in the open earlier. And good prospects already. This is the bonding and affection that I was speaking about earlier. They are incredibly close companions. And the radios are going haywire. Oh, it is, it is us, it is us. Sorry, Kirst, it was us um, causing the radios to go crazy. Good, well now that we've got the comm sorted out, we can enjoy these lines who look like they may be starting to do some aloe grooming, or at least there's a thoughts of grooming one another. These are all good prospects, what we're seeing here. The fact that they just got up and moved a small distance is a sign that slowly their hunger may be kicking in. The desire to go and quench their thirst is kicking in. And hopefully it won't be too long before they get up and active. Let me see if I can sneak us a little bit closer. We're not in the best spot here. So there's three on the right and still one on the left of us. Not easy to see that one, so let's just focus on these ones. And I'm going to have to take over from Brian here, otherwise he's not going to be in a good spot. There we go. So forgive me if this camera work is terrible. Okay, let me get comfy here with the beanbag. Brian, you can now relax. Okay. Cool, let's see what happens. We're gonna get some awesome close-ups, that's for sure. Well, Isabella, who's just four years old, would like to know if I think lion's feet are ticklish. And let's just get a nice close-up view of the lion's feet for you, Isabella. There we go. And no, Isabella, I don't think they are very ticklish. But then again, I've never tried to tickle a lion, so I'm not too sure. But some of you with domestic house cats may know i've never really had cats much but i know dogs aren't really ticklish that i know of i think maybe it's just us humans that get like that but maybe i'm wrong isabella who knows well here comes another lioness this is going to be awesome we're going to be able to see a little bit more affection here and possibly she may plonk herself down right on top of the other lioness, which usually you can see the one looking at her knowingly, saying, uh-uh, this is a bad idea. There we go. Exactly. They just can't resist lying right on top of one another. And here we have a carpet of lioness. Good, well now that things have calmed down here, we're going to send you across to Jamie, who's found you something she would like to share. We will try and catch up with Scott in as soon as possible see what's happening with those lions at the moment he's struggling a little bit to be able to hear final control lucky for us you've caught up with us at just the right time as we are in the final stages of our journey towards the hyena den to find out what's happening there as as we speak brent is currently exploring the far reaches of it seems though he's up in Buffelswick Dam. He's got a special
special treat. He's driving the, one of the landowners around, so he gets to explore new and unknown territory for him. And I think absolutely loving it. Last I heard from the radio trans transaction, he was, or the radio conversation rather, he was chatting all about the cheetah that he was tracking. I think he's having a ball of an afternoon. We're just going to go through a bit of a signal dip. Well, as you can see, I'm playing around here. I've got you a super close-up visual of the back pad of a lion's paw. Yeah, the little toes. With little f pieces of fluffy fur in between each toe. Awesome stuff. And what I'm going to try and do, I've just seen one lioness has just poked her head up. Let's see if we can't get you some views of her before she goes back to sleep. There you are. Hello, pretty lady. And look at her eyelashes. Awesome stuff. Holding her nose up into the wind. Possibly she can smell something that we cannot. Look at this. Awesome. Let's see if we can't get any closer to this. It's obviously a bit of a gamble going for these close-ups because they can move their head at any moment. Like that. There we go. Oh, let's see if we can see that fly in the background. There's a little fly of sorts. Cool. But let's go back to the lion. Who are all now fast asleep. Ears twitching to get rid of flies. Let's keep an eye on this ear here. And there you can see the little flies. And they are biting flies, so they are biting both the lions and as well as us. Sadly though, we don't have our ears are not capable of being flicked like this. Not too sure what got her attention there. Hello Dave in Florida. If you'd like to know if there have been any studies online confirming that they dream while they're asleep and Yes, we've done our own studies here, and it certainly does appear that they do dream while they sleep. Just to reposition the beanbag quickly. Um, yes, they do certainly dream while they sleep, and you can tell this by their little twitchings and murmurings, just as a domestic cat would. So there we go. That can be confirmed. She's got a little scar on her nose, that's a good characteristic. And imagine all the chewing and scenes that those lips have seen over the years. How many animals they've chewed through. Quite a number, I would guess. The last animal they chewed through was a buffalo on Sibambilia a few days back, or at least that's what we know of. Lions can very often make smaller kills, and at this time of the year with lots of youngsters around, they could be killing young calves that they feed on in the nights and doesn't really have a huge impact. Oh, time for a quick reposition for her. So sometimes they may make a kill and not be clearly evident that they have in fact. Oh, you two are trying to fight for a good spot there. In a 
varietals and you're interested as to why they are lying so close to one another and it's certainly not to you know keep warm it's an incredibly warm afternoon and that's why they're sleeping in the shade and it's merely an, an affection thing I guess you could like it to a happy couple on honeymoon in some tropical island resort lying in bed snuggling in hot and sweaty conditions when it doesn't make sense to snuggle um, yeah it's purely an affection thing and a bonding thing but it's not for it's not for comfort if anything it becomes uncomfortable for them to do this yet they do it so it's kind of one of those things that you'd have to actually be able to communicate with lions in order to understand exactly what they're thinking but in my mind it doesn't make sense and you saw these two here I mean they were kind of kicking one another around a bit trying to get the best spot so they've kind of worked things out now but you'll notice that they do enjoy having one paw on another one of the pride members and these two are touching one another they're all inter interlinked I guess indirectly they're all connected in one way and I guess it just emphasizes the strong bonds that these prides do have with one another let's see what's going on with the clouds there's not many clouds at the moment there were some out to the west earlier but that's changed there's the sun should be setting soon but all of the clouds that were around earlier have disappeared so cloudless skies Hi Sarah, and again well done on that great work you did on this Pride of Lions. Sarah did a research project that she got an A for, for those of you who don't know, and even convinced her teacher into joining into Safari Live and checking it all out. So who knows, maybe Michelle, the teacher, is also watching today. And Sarah would like to know if this Pride reconnected with the Matimba males, if they would remember one another and if it would be a happy meeting and yes Sarah I think it would they'll definitely remember one another and I don't think that there'd be any animosity or hardship or problems if they did it's only strangers that are the problem and the Birmingham boys were essentially strangers they were young males that these ladies didn't know before and when they arrived understandably these ladies thought no hang on who are you and we're not just going to become friends without working out what's what but now that they know both the Birmingham boys and the Matimba males, it's good signs for these lioness because the more males that they are accustomed with, the better. The less problems they will have going forward and the more protection they will have from different angles. Yeah, well, some good news. Jamie has arrived with some other meat-eating animals and we haven't seen them for quite some time so I'm sure you're all going to join updates on what's going on there. Apart of course from the hyena sighting yesterday, we haven't been to the hyena den in a while and we've arrived to find one very, very round female and one very sleepy sub-adult looking precariously perched on the side wall but welcome for new viewers to one of our favorite places to be the home of the spotted hyena clan of Juma or at least the temporary home until it starts to get a bit too smelly and they decide to move out no sign at present of the little cubs that inhabit this particular den. We have arrived a little bit early, so it's still a bit hot for them, and they're probably still hiding in the tunnels of the den itself, resting up and preparing for a night of playfulness and mischief. I want to say this is pretty. It's got a little nick out of her right ear. definitely not corky and it's definitely not the matriarch or madam <laughs> it's 
somebody who is equally plagued by flies, if not more so, than Andrew and myself. She is very, very hot. Now, before we disappeared and unfortunately got stuck in a bit of a black signal dip, a bit earlier I was chatting about the answer to Curious One's question in this particular drought. And of course, our hyenas have been successful and they have been given an advantage in this particular climate but curious one wanted to know whether or not farmers or how farmers feed their cattle oh i stand corrected it's not pretty in fact i think it was the matriarch that just walked past my mistake i didn't recognize her lying down she's calling oh there's another hyena there of what's happening and I think that was pretty with November and she went up to have a some kind of communication with them it's impossible to know exactly what was being said there watch the submissive behavior of the hyena on the right compared to the one that came in behind Sub-adult coming to investigate. Oh, instant nerves. And I think what was happening there was pretty was hiding. Well, that one hyena was hiding off in the thicket of the Tambueti trees, which provides for slightly better cover and shade. She did have one of the cubs with her. It's so dense in there, it's almost impossible for me to be able to get a view or for Andrew to be able to show you, unless that cub decides to follow the adult out again. There's a good chance that that cub will come out. And I think what they were doing is sheltering from this west-facing side of the den is a very hot place to be on an afternoon like this. As you can see, the entrance to the den where the matriarch was initially lying is right in direct sunlight. There is action over there. I can't see exactly which hyenas are there. They look like Bella and one other. Come on, you lot. Out you come. Come and say hello. It's a bit cooler now. Come and explore outside the den. As we've said, this clan has been particularly successful. Oh, my word. Sorry, curious one. I keep trying to answer your question and then get distracted. You want to know how farmers feed their cattle and if the government helps to subsidize them. There's a possibility of government subsidies in order to help to keep the country's economy going in that respect. I'm uncertain as to how that will actually play out in practice. Otherwise, the farm, it will be on the farmers themselves to be able to feed their cattle and provide for them with farm-grown lucerne. And we've argued before that this drought might be good or there's a possibility for it to be beneficial for the ecosystem of this Kruger National Park as a whole, but for farmers there is no real way around it. There's no real positive spin to the effect that it will have on their livelihoods and that of the country. And while we sit and look at the leader of the pack, or the leader of the clan in this, ca in this case, Lisa wanted to know what we call this clan. I've nicknamed it the Baby Boomers on occasion, it's just simply because we've had little cubs appearing out of every entrance to the den before. 
but it doesn't really have a name apart from probably the Juma clan, since Juma does seem to be the heartland of their home range. Nobody really refers to it as anything else, and as far as I know, most of the names given to the clans are either based on the matriarch or based on the area that they are in. It's not really within the safari tradition to name either hyenas or the different clans within the, or within the area. And those hyenas have definitely decided that on a hot day like today, the Tambuerti thicket is the place to be. All tucked away in there. Uh, we had a little bit of insight yesterday as to where hyena go in the middle of the day when things are hot and uncomfortable, when we bumped into three hyena lying in a mud wallow on Battalier Road, close to where the leopards were mating. And what was really nice about that sighting, for those of you who missed yesterday's, either yesterday's sunrise safari or the sunset safari, a couple of weeks ago we saw this female that we're looking at now attack another hyena quite savagely, along with another female from the group. And she still, this female still bears the scars from that particular fight around her shoulders and her front end. The hyena that they attacked was banned. I, I mean, I don't think they were trying to kill her. It was a case of discipline. I know, yes, I'm talking about you. Um, but she did look a little bit worse for the wear. She limped off looking at us quite with that incredible, I don't know what, how you describe it, a face that inspired empathy from all of the viewers as she walked past with her torn up ears and the limp. And you'll be happy to know that I saw her yesterday, safe and sound, in the pan, no longer limping, no longer even looking bloody or injured, and both ears still looking firmly attached to her head. I thought that you might appreciate that particular update. It's a sighting like that is always hard to witness, and it brings us quite firmly and nicely round to, if not the end of the book, then certainly the end of that chapter in the hyena clan's life. Now, the fascinating thing about the days of the hyena den, as it has been nicknamed before, is that it is almost in its own way full of, always full of drama and intricacies, and of course the wonder of it is that we'll never know exactly what's going on. We can guess and we can apply expert research, but even experts admit that they don't know everything there is to know about the spotted hyenas. But since they're quite at peace at the moment and there's no sign of the playful little cubs, let's pop back over to Scott and his lions. Well, isn't it wonderful that you guys have been spoiled with leopard, lion and hyena, three of the apex predators of the Sabi Sands. And who knows what may happen before the end of the drive. Maybe we'll get a surprise visit from a cheetah or some wild dog. That'll be really wonderful. I wonder where the wild dog have moved off to. Haven't seen any updates on our Rangers WhatsApp group, which covers the movements of all the animals in the Sabi Sands. There's two different packs that we usually see, the Sands Pack and the Investec Pack. Cheetah, for those of you who are new to Safari Live, so, seldom grace us with their presence here in the Sabi Sand, so we've only seen them a handful of times since we started filming here in November 2014. Angie in Wisconsin. I'm glad you're observing these felines very closely and you've noticed these small spots or rosettes on the legs of these lions and are wondering why they are there. And they are part of the Panthera family. So these are Panthera leo, Panthera pardus, the leopard, is a relative of theirs, so a distant relative. And just like the jaguars, who also have these spots, 
so too do lions. So they are born with very prominent spotting and when they are cubs, they will be covered in these spots and they tend to fade with age. And the female whose leg you're looking at now is a younger female, that's why her spots are more prominent than the legs of the lioness on her left which are more faded. And you'll be able to compare the two now as Brian zooms out. Clearly very different. Obviously genetics does play a role to a degree but age is the main determining factor of how many spots you will see on a lion. The younger they are, the more spotted or rosetted they, would, they will be. Nice big stretch. And these are good signs and slowly, very, very slowly, these lines are beginning to rise. Uh oh, it sounds like we've got to educate one of our new viewers, Brian, on a couple of things. Firstly, that yes, Brian, this is entirely live. It's happening this very second in South Africa and it's very, very good to have you with us. I'm happy that you like the movie The Lion King. I'm told there's a couple of sequels. I'm not sure if they were any good. I only watched the first one. But the one problem with The Lion King, Brian, is that it has taught you a negative mentality for hyena. This we will change and if you continue to enjoy our safaris with us, you will learn that hyena are wonderful animals and are very, very important in this ecosystem, just as important as the lion, and no different to lion, in the fact that lion are also scavengers and thieves. They will steal from and bully hyena, cheetah, leopard, wild dog. They are the kings of the bullying and thieving kingdom. And in some cases, the lions have been known to steal more from the hyena than the, lion, the hyena from the lion. So, even though you may for now not like hyena, there's no justified reason why you shouldn't, well at least other than the fact that you watch The Lion King where they are portrayed as the enemy. But hopefully, as Jamie is at the den site now, the little cubs will come out in time. And trust me, when you get to see those youngsters playing around, you are possibly going to change your mind instantaneously. So yes, Brian, this is live. It's great to have you with us. Let us know where you're watching. Always great to have an idea where in the world you are. And like I say, we look forward to teaching you that hyena are in fact awesome animals. And I don't think it's going to take very long for that to happen. Brian in Toronto, I couldn't agree more with you with the topic of marauding male lions coming into an area establishing their dominance. Why would they kill lioness that they could potentially mate with in the future? And it doesn't make sense at the outset. And I guess to put things in perspective is that a lot of things that us as humans do in times of conflict also don't make sense and are inexplainable. But in the height of the passion and the rage, with all the hormones flowing as they come through to try and establish themselves, if they do meet any resistance, they will not tolerate that. And I guess that's fundamental for them to be able to really lay down the law and establish dominance. I guess one thing that may help it make a little bit of sense is that these lioness you can see how close they are and affectionate they are. They have got extreme bonds with their pride. And a young male within their pride is going to be looked after the same as the other lioness. And young Junior, who was within this pride, may have been the one that these lioness, lioness were trying to protect against the Birmingham boys. And they essentially sacrificed themselves for that young male. So we weren't around for those fights so we couldn't see it happening firsthand and therefore can only speculate as to what exactly happened but that is one scenario that you know makes 
it more understandable why a male would kill a female that's trying to stand up for males within her pride or even her own cubs, which any mother is going to defend with their lives, even if it is against their own kind. So there's another scenario that kind of will justify the killing to a degree. Cats in Tampa, you are wondering whether we should be worried that Amber Eyes is not with this pride due to them being such affectionate animals. Is it normal for a pride member to uh, tear away from the pride for a while? And Cat, there's nothing to worry about. It's completely normal for lioness within prides to peel off, go do their thing, come back and rejoin. Maybe she's in season. Maybe she's the kind of alpha lioness, the lead lioness who needs to go and do some business deals with the Birmingham boys, make sure that they're in check. Hard to say exactly why they do splits up, but it's, it's common with all prides that I've seen over the years. Sometimes they fragment into little groups and they'll rejoin. Sometimes they'll fragment and part ways for good. And that's happened here in the Sabi Sands fairly re recently with a pride called the Salala Pride, also known as the Mangan Pride. And there's a portion now called the Salala Breakaway Pride, as well as the other Salala Lioness. The Styx Lioness are another good example of three sets of two Lioness that are sometimes all together and sometimes in three different groups of two. So always slight variations and no exact reason why one proud may do this and another may not. Again, you know, we can often think of ourselves as a species and relates us to animals and decisions an animal will make. And therefore, you understand immediately that one group of humans may live in one way in a certain area of the planet, yet the very same species may live very differently in another part of the planet. So almost like different tribes or different races or different humans in general have different cultures and different kind of practices, so too could lion and hyena that live in various parts of Africa. And that's why you do find animals acting differently where they do live in different places. In some parts of Africa, these lions, these animals will hunt elephants, whereas here it's never really even considered an option. So there's another example of how differently these animals can behave depending on where they are and depending on the conditions in those areas. So we've just got a list through of what the Lion King did get right. So I'm not sure who that came from. Oh, the real scientist. Thank you, the real scientist, for providing us with the three things that you think the Lion King got right. Sadly, I need to correct you as well as Brian, who sent in the earlier thing about hyena being the enemy. And the first thing that you said that the Lion King got right was that the females are in charge, so that's correct. B, you said, I think that Scar's mane was glorious. Yes, I think Scar did have an impressive mane. Mufasa's brother, I think it was. But your third and final fact is not true. The lioness are not the only ones to do the hunting. And as far as I remember, I remember, didn't? Mufasa died trying to hunt some wildebeest in the canyon? Oh, was that Simba? Somebody, somebody got caught up, but it was a male lion running after wildebeest in the stampede in the valley. 
Oh, uh, it's because he was trying to save Simba. He wasn't hunting. Simba got caught in the stampede and then Mufasa jumped down the cliff to save him. That's what happened. My memory is blurry. But real scientists, male lions can hunt, do hunt, and are more often than not, in, in, in my experience, on their own, not with prides of lioness to do the hunting for them. And they are very effective killers when they need to be. So it's not only the lioness that can and do hunts. Good. We're going to send you back to Jamie, and I'm hoping those little hyena cubs are going to poke their head out of their burrow soon and show Brian exactly why they are not the enemy. And you're about to see something that will make you reevaluate your entire assessment of hyenas if you've never seen them before. And one of them just gambled out now. That's pretty hard to hate something that cute. Little wobbly hyena cubs dashing about on uncoordinated legs. And Brian, it's amazing the impression that certain films can leave. And unfortunately for the Lion King, or for the spotted hyena at least, the Lion King didn't portray them in the most favorable light. And in fact, demonize them in a quite an unfair way because they are probably the most intelligent predator out here and at this age one of the most adorable to look at the cubs are currently dashing in and out of this tambuti thicket and hopefully now that it's a bit cooler they're going to get brave enough to come and visit us and sometimes at around this age, they even get to the point where they feel as though they want to come and investigate the car even closer. Interaction happening between the mothers. There we go. A little bit of anal pasting around the den, something that sets hyenas apart from other predators and puts them in their own family group. Tend to think of them as dogs. Most people tend to think of them as dogs, but they're not dogs and they're not cats. And in fact, if you look at the evolutionary line, they are slightly, and I say slightly, more closely related to cats than they are to dogs in that cats and hyenas share a common ancestor way back. Come on, little cubs. And that, of course, is why we refer to the cubs as cubs and not pups. Little monsters starting to get brave, roaming further and further afield. And I feel as though in the days that I haven't been at the hyena den, the December twins have grown so fast. In fact, when one of them first popped out, I thought it was November. I was very surprised. What a bit of a limp. I'm not sure if that's just because it was sliding on the termite mound wall. Could also, of course, have stepped on a thorn. And the braver they get, the more they increase their chances that that sort of thing will happen. Apparently you saw one wander far out with Scott the other day before realizing how far away it was from the safety of the den and dashing back to safety. And it's only really when their mothers are around that they demonstrate this bold, curious behavior. And of course, we're all holding fingers as we always do when we get to this hyena den, that the brand or the newest set of cubs will actually decide to show themselves. In the meantime, these little bundles of trouble will do. And for new viewers, uh, Brian included, but any others who are joining us for the first time, just a quick interesting fact, one of the mysteries surrounding spotted hyenas is that they are one of the only animals in the mammal kingdom where the females are bigger, stronger and more dominant than the males. The only truly matriarchal mammal probably in the world, if not Africa. Come on guys, call your cubs out. I just saw one. Did you see? Oh, there we go. Like a little dolphin. <laughs> Hello. There we go. 
And Brian, if you still dislike spotted hyenas after this afternoon spent at the den, then I'm doing my job wrong. Because just look at that. Look who's coming out. Bit of cuddle time with a cousin there from one of the older cubs. Play with me, entertain me, whoopsie. And yes, whilst they are scavengers, this little one, it's hard to believe, but this little one is going to grow up to be a fearsome predator as well. And more than comfortable with hunting his or her own prey. And not only are they female dominant, but they're also very difficult to tell the difference between the males and the females. Because the females with their high levels of male hormones have false male genitalia. <laughs> One pile of hyena moms and cubs. And Dorothy apparently has changed her perception completely of hyenas since both coming on safari and watching Safari Live, and I'm thrilled to hear it. Look at your little one. Come on. There should be two of these little black cubs, little brown cubs. Oh. <laughs> this is the one without the scars on its back. Amazing how they've grown, how fast hyena cubs do grow. Hyena mothers are some of the best role models a baby animal could have. No, baby, that's not mommy. You can't drink from there. <laughs> some well-meaning curiosity. And cat in Tampa. You're saying that the new hyena den were, oh, sorry, the new cubs at the hyena den were waiting for James's return. Well, good thing James is back once again on Juma soil. And he will be joining you on drives in the next few days. But I'm sure you'll all be thrilled to hear that Mr. Hendry is back in the house, I believe is how the cool kids said. little one. You can come out. So nice to see them getting to that point of a curiosity. Mm. And he's being very vocal. It's the sign that's come in now. Making lots of noise. Very nervous approach to the matriarch. And apart from being one of the most fascinating animals in terms of their social dynamics, they also have a wide range of vocalizations, all meaning different things, and translating as different approaches, from contact calls to, in this case, pacification. And apart from the, vocal, the vocalizations, there is, of course, one other aspect of animal communication. And you can see it now in the way that this adult is acting submissively even towards the cubs. And if you watch the ears and the tails, they will tell you plenty about what that animal is visually communicating. And a socially awkward girl, you were wondering if hyenas use their tails in the same way that dogs do. Yes and no. They, they're definitely a vital part of the social communication, just as they are with dogs. They don't wag their tails necessarily in the same way that dogs do, 
but the tail will tell you a lot about the mood of the animal. So if it's tucked down in a similar way to dogs do, close to sort of between the back legs, then they are feeling uncomfortable. And if it is raised and curled over the back, that is happiness or excitement or at least a sign of dominance when they curve their tail backwards like that, across and arching over the back. You also want to know if they ever chase their tails in the same way that dogs do. I'm trying to think if I've ever seen a hyena chase its tail, and I haven't, but I wouldn't say that that means that they don't chase their tail. Andrew, have you ever seen a hyena chase mm, its tail? No. I've seen them, I've seen the cubs bite their tails before. I've seen them twist around and bite it. And I've seen them bite their foot as well. Occasionally. So the socially awkward girl, I wouldn't be at all surprised if hyenas occasionally have a good go at chasing their tails. And Brian, in your discussion of the Lion King, we have one further character sitting here to bring up, just since they are here. Hey, look, it's Zazu, or at least the yellow build version of Zazu, all coming in to roost in the knobthorn tree above our heads. Certainly as vocal, Although not carrying quite the gravitas of Rowan Atkinson's voice. But probably as entertaining to watch as Zazu was in The Lion King. Zazu was a red-billed hornbill. These guys are the yellow-billed hornbills. So the cousin of Zazu, let's put it that way. Go. In comes little one. <laughs> Hello. They're all looking up. <laughs> it's difficult for Andrew to show you, so he's going to have to show you from behind the vehicle. But I saw, I'm sure you saw them all lift their heads up. They lifted it up at that nyala. It's currently doing the nyala thing of having a quick rub of its horns, but immediately lost interest. Come on, little cubs. <laughs> and Cecilia, you've been listening to the sounds coming from the hyena den, and you were saying that either your stomach is growling or hyenas are calling. Is that hyena in the Tumbuti tree? Just above it there. Look at this. You little monkey. You're going to fall down. You are going to fall down and hurt yourself. <laughs> Ooh, you naughty things. Tree climbing. And their parents have certainly chosen an ideal den site. It comes complete with safety plus jungle gym. And this hyena hasn't stopped moaning the entire time since it's been here. I don't know which hyena it is. It's now hidden itself behind a tree. And the whole approach has been a constant placatory low call. Obviously trying to win over the approval of the more dominant hyenas. with the cubs, it is behaving carefully. Very submissive, whichever hyena this happens to be. Oh, look how bold you are. Come on. Ah, oh, there's number two. There's number two. Here we go. I'm sure James is going to be so excited to see these two little cubs that he argued again and again were somewhere in this den. 
and they only popped out just a day or two after James went on leave. He is the one who discovered this particular hyena den. I'm sure that he'll be incredibly excited to head out for the first time and to see them popping their heads out and growing bolder by the day. Now, Brian, I hope we have you convinced. One last argument to throw at you, and that is the fact that in terms of problem solving and communication, hyenas fall or rank the top of almost any other social animal, and that even includes some of the great apes like the chimpanzees. They are actually shown in social experiments to have greater powers of social communication and teamwork than almost any other animal. Hey, hyena. And they're cute. And of course, that leads to the next question, which is one that Susan asks, and she wondered if there's ever been any cases of domestication of hyena. Susan, there are cases where, particularly in Nigeria, there is a tribe that is famous for and I use this word very hesitantly, domesticating hyena. Hyenas are taken as cubs and they are kept by the men of the tribe to act as sort of status holders. They're almost always muzzled, at least in modern times. And it's something that I always look on with severe reluctance at the idea of converting what is a wild animal into a pet. Dogs and cats, of course, have had thousands and thousands of years of selective breeding and domestication. Hyenas, it would be almost impossible to do in one generation. And those of you who've had puppies and kittens can just imagine why having a hyena with 10 times the jaw strength of a puppy or kitten, chewing the various appliances or maybe your table legs, or whatever else they happen to lay their teeth on, your shoes, would be perhaps not the most ideal idea. If you combine that with the anal gland and the fact that they instinctively anal paste from a very young age, you're left with the possibility of maybe the idea that hyenas aren't the most appealing in terms of domestic animals. And it is far nicer to see them in this sort of domestic setting, enjoying just being as wild as nature intended them to be. And speaking of as nature intended them to be, let's pop over to Scott and have a look at his lions. Well, I am very happy that you guys are being spoilt with some high action over at the hyena den. Here, not so much. Low action, zero action possibly other than the odd tail and ear twitching to keep the flies at bay. The Unkuhuma carpet of lions is unchanged. So I fear that sadly, unless a warthog comes running straight over them, we are not going to see too much action from them today. As they would have started to stir a little bit more by now if they were to get up in the next 10 minutes. But it is great that they've at least been on the property and we were spoilt with an incredible morning with them. We got to see them on the move. There was a lot of running around and playing with one another as after they left the Juma waterhole area and headed through the quarantine clearings. And the golden morning sunlight that we had on them was fantastic. And two vehicles in that sighting, Brent and myself, were leapfrogging. Getting some wonderful views for you guys. Hi there, Dory in South Carolina, and you've noticed that these lioness are in good condition with regard to their parasite load. There don't appear to be too many ticks on them. Whereas the lions that you saw in the Masai Mara in Kenya were riddled with ticks. And there could be a few reasons for that. The time of the year, 
may increase the tick load. Summer technically should be the highest tick load, but maybe because of the droughts, there aren't as many ticks around as normal. That coupled with the lioness's nutrition and health at any given stage, if lioness or any pride is unhealthy, they will spend less time grooming one another and grooming themselves and therefore have a higher tick load. And obviously that's a slippery slope. As condition goes down, more and ticks, more and more ticks jump up and onto the lions and therefore condition is further diminished. And then even more ticks get to latch on. So it could have been a sickly pride of lion that you were viewing. And it's not uncommon for prides of lion to go through harsh times. Just like us as humans, some families may be well fed and others may be starving and in not such a good situation. And the same goes for the Lion Kingdom. Because the lion that I saw when I was up in the Masai Mara didn't stand out as having more, any more ticks than the lions down here in South Africa. So interesting stuff and not too sure what exactly the cause could be for that exact pride of lion. But like I've said, there's a few variables or reasons as to why they may have been looking riddled with ticks more so than these. You can see the nipples here of a lioness that has raised cubs in the past, so she's an adult. Unless they've given cubs, you given birth to cubs and suckled cubs, they typically won't have very prominent nipples. And I guess Ah, now I'm very happy with the way Mike's thinking and he's been wondering where the fifth and missing lioness Amber Eyes could be at the moment and what she could be doing. I didn't bring this up earlier and should have and thank you to Mike for raising this as an op option as to why, why she has gone and what she is doing. She could very well have separated herself from the pride in order to give birth. And it's not uncommon for lioness to do this. It's not a strict rule, but more often than not, a lioness will slink off from the pride and give birth in a secluded area, hunt for herself, do her own thing, until the cubs are about two weeks of age. And by then they'll be kind of big enough to be introduced to the rest of the pride. So hopefully, Mike, I hope you are right, and wouldn't that be a wonderful surprise to get some more lion cubs in and around Juma. The last cubs were born to the Styx lioness, and sadly, they were killed at about three months of age by the Birmingham boys. So those are the last cubs we've seen, and we've had a bit of a shortage of cubs. Other than the hyena, they've been great, and they've provided us a constant flow of cubs, but the lion and leopard we've been less fortunate with over the last year or so which is fine because we're building up cub credits and we are going to get spoils at some point hello to Kyle who would like to know the average number of lioness within a pride and I'd say between five and ten would be an average pride Anything bigger than that, you start getting to quite a large pride. But it's not uncommon to, well, it is uncommon, but occasionally from time to time you get mega prides of up to 30 or 40 lions. I know there's one running around the Kruger National Park at the moment that I'm hopefully going to be able to go and track down on leave, on my next leave. And within that pride of 40 odd lion, there's a young male lion who is a white lion and he is the only white lion male surviving in the wild at the moment in South Africa or in Africa as a whole. The other two white lions are both lioness, a very rare genetic throwback so hoping to track them down. Now, even though the, these stretches are signs of the lion slowly waking up, I will put a lot of money down saying that we are not going to see them active before the end of the safari, sadly. 
I wish it was the other way around. But I fear that these lines are not going to be going anywhere for at least another half an hour or 45 minutes. Unless, of course, like I said, a potential prey item runs past, that will change their mood immediately. Okay guys, well it's time to start saying goodbye and thank you for joining in and it's always fun to be out on safari with you Brian, wonderful to have you back behind the camera and also Jerry, welcome back, thanks for your hard work helping out Kirsty who directed the show, it's been great fun, thanks to all the new viewers who've joined in, sent through questions, Brian I hope you're still watching and I hope you have enjoyed the glimpses you've got of that hyena cub and we'll hopefully you'll get a few more views of them now when you go back to Jamie. We'll see you all on the next safari. And as the crusader for, if not hyena love, then at least respect for these incredible animals, I'm still sitting with the spotted hyenas at their den site, watching them interact and wander about in the most fascinating way and it's always intriguing to observe the dynamics of the clan and the way that they behave with each other both submissive and dominant behavior and to see these two little cubs getting braver and braver and show affection not just to their mother but the hyenas in the rest of the clan Look at that. Still not sure what's all over that little one's back. I'm fairly certain that it's scarring at this point. Be interesting to know. We will never know where that scarring came from. And by in the next few months, it'll probably have disappeared. Patrick, you definitely are not alone in your comparison of the hyena cubs to bears. The little ones really do look like little bear cubs. And you were wondering if there's any evolutionary relationship to bears. Not that I'm aware of, but I could stand corrected on that. <laughs> I can see what you mean in terms of the way that they look. I'm not sure if you heard that insect zoom past us earlier, but Sharon, who's watching in Pittsburgh, has got her bush ears on and heard the buzzing insects zooming around whenever we're at the hyena den and you're wondering what they are. And Sharon, it's the spider hunting wasps that are zooming past and at some point on Bushwalk, I'm sure one of us will manage to capture one on camera. And they seem to really enjoy the area around the hyena den. I'm not sure if that's because we spend so much time here that we hear them regularly or if there's one or two in particular that favor this habitat. But if I sit quietly for a moment, you might even hear one buzz past. And if you watch every now and again, the hyenas will actually lift their heads up and look at it as the insect itself flies over. But very well observed. I'm impressed, as always, as I always am, with the observational skills. It's amazing to see this den as active as it has been this afternoon adults and cubs wandering through and for the first time really well not the first time but one of the first times that we've got to see the cubs be as bold as they have been also incredible to see how much the older cubs have grown oh gonna be brave you're gonna go wandering off after one of the adults oh maybe not 
ladies and gentlemen, we are sadly drawing to the end of our sunset safari. And as the evening draws to a close and the night starts to get dark, don't forget that our times will be changing on the 1st of February and we will be starting our sunrise safari half an hour later than we usually do. So just to give us some time with the, with the sun rising. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you as always for joining us. It has been an absolute pleasure and what an enjoyable afternoon. From spotted cats, cats to lions to spotted hyenas, we've definitely had it all on this particular drive. Big thank you to Andrew for his fantastic camera work and great questions, and to Scott and welcome back Brian, as well as the lovely ladies in FC. We have Kirsten Jerry this afternoon, and our technical crew that have worked wonders with Rusty. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world, and we will catch you tomorrow for the Sunrise Safari. Cheers, guys.